up right after her. These two women are going to knock it out of the park. I just wanted to talk to you about plutocracy. Boy, okay, don't turn your ears off like it's a class session. This is important. For the last couple of years, I have been hearing people say, oh my God, we're now living in a socialist society. Oh my God, we're living in a fascist society. And I'm like, oh my God, we can't be both at the same time. It's not possible. Got an amen on that one? Thank you. What that tells me is people don't know things. What? Of course Washington gets away with what it wants to get away with. If we don't even know when we sound like we don't know things. Because we haven't educated ourselves well enough to know the difference between one thing and another. I teach sociology. If I didn't know the difference between socialism and fascism, I would not have a job. I do my best to help the public know that difference. It's critical. But there's a new word I want to introduce to you, and it's not new for all of you, but it's new for too many of you. Not in this crowd. It's called plutocracy. That is a corporate controlled government. Okay, I'm used to having to provide evidence for everything I say. That's what happens when you're an academic, and that's fair. What I love about what I do is I don't get to just spout. I have to back it up. So I'm here to do that right now. How do I know we live in a corporate-run society? How do I know that this is a pluc plutocratic society? Why? Recently, and I say to everybody, Tony Hayward, I'm in love with you. Thank you. Thank you for being so bad at PR that you didn't hide what you really thought about the people. Thanks for making my job easier. You know, a lot of people don't believe me when I talk about corporate reality and power and multinational corporations and how they exploit people all over the globe. Most recently in the Gulf Coast. But this is not new. Plutocracy is pretty much what we've always been since this whole shooting match began. When we wanted to get away from a king and people were peasants, how did we get capitalism? Capitalism, there are a lot of theories on that. I'm not going to give those to you today and you'll be glad that I don't. But in, in short, people started having money who had not had money in the past. That money gave them influence and new people became influential, prestigious, and had access to power who had not before. So it really isn't about whether or not you have a king, it's about who holds power. And when people with a lot of money, because of that money, because of the strings they can pull, you know, oh, oh, I do want to say one thing. When I teach a sociology class, and I hope I'm not fired after this speech, by the way, um, we define that as the ability to force people, to make people, or to cause people to do what is against their will. That's the essence of power and coercion. That doesn't have to happen through somebody coming and putting handcuffs on you. That happens just by you having to go to work and not having an adequate paycheck. That happens when you have to go to work on an oil rig and you know the danger's there and you've written a will, as in the case of one man, because you don't know what's going to happen on that rig. And, it, and, the, and guess what? It happened. It happened. But in a plutocracy, and I think you get the message, that government, in essence, is powerless. They're power, made powerless by the money behind them that controls them. Why do I know we live in a plutocracy? Because our very powerful national leaders allowed BP to be in charge of its own cleanup. 
that's what we call supporting evidence. Our government allowed a $20 billion cap on making everyone and everything whole that was affected by the carelessness, and it's a deliberate carelessness, by a corporation that knew they were not going to have to make those violations right. They knew they were not going to be held accountable. VBP had way more violations than any other oil company, and that went on and on and on for a long time. That is what I call data. Those data collectively, and it's not just BP, folks. I couldn't just say BP has had carte blanche and say that's what makes us live in a plutocratic society. But it's the history of this country. It's the history of having to fight for labor rights. It's the history of having people tell you that you can afford to buy a home when you really can't because they've, got, they've, they've done their scheming and they've created what we now know as subprime loans. And we bought into that because at the other side of it, powerful corporations have taught us through advertisements, through marketing, that our lives are worthless if we don't have a certain house and a certain number of cars and a certain type of car, not just cars, right. certain type of occupation. That's, those are issues of social class. Those social class issues came out, again, not only through Tony Hayward's mouth, but also through the board of directors of BP when he said, we'll, we'll do what we can to help the small people. <laughs> do you hear the contempt in that? Yeah. It's utter contempt. If there weren't contempt, how would they have allowed those people to die on that rig when they knew exactly what was wrong with that rig? And they pushed it to make that money anyway. Did you know that there's a law in the books that says that a corporation's first responsibility is to its shareholders? Do you realize that that means safety for workers, pay, adequate pay, environmental responsibility, and a number of other things come way down the list of priorities for corporations. It's money, you know that. But we live in a plutocracy, folks. And it's a growing plutocracy. I think there are a few solutions, but there's one that I want to hand out right now. What I started out with when I took the microphone today. People, what I tell my students every day is I don't care, because I teach at a community college. If your major is plumbing, if it's heating and air conditioning, you still need a liberal arts education. If you don't take political science, you're not going to know the difference between fascism and socialism unless you go read books and find them on your own. I encourage you to do that. I'm not saying that you have to go to college to know things. But I'm, I will say this, it made a huge difference in my ability to put a good argument together. It made a huge difference in my confidence level in terms of approaching people, knowing what I was talking about and not backing down on it because they knew how to sound powerful. Okay? We have to know things. We don't know things from watching ABC News, Fox News, NBC, CNN, MSNBC, I don't care. You know, you, you can go there and find out what happened that day, but you still need to even take that information with a grain of salt. I agree. Yeah. Men, women, children, we don't get our information from five minutes of sound bites. And listen, listen, listen is important. You don't get to just pick who sounds like you and like them the best. We can't live that way. If we don't call out our own folks, <laughs> they love that. We've got, they've got our vote instantly. Oh my gosh, they've gotten us on a moral issue. I can't, I can't vote for anyone else. They've pulled my moral heartstrings. 
There must not be another issue that is, is as important as that moral one. Oh, that is one of the best, most genius strategies in the political playbooks. I've worked in a lot of po political campaigns. I've seen this. You, you have to do your work. You have to hold the politicians in your party more accountable than those in the other party. We're taught to focus on the other guy. By doing that, we learn how to make each other the enemy. Oh, but then we don't realize what kind of society we're really living in. How many people knew about plutocracy before today? I'm not surprised coming from this crowd that they know. But how many of the rest of you know that? All right. We need to call those folks out a few blocks away and right behind us. If we vote for them, we must know if they are voting counter to what they said they would do. Stop looking at the other one. You know they're not going to do what you want them to do. Make the ones who made promises stand by them. Mr. Obama, I voted for you. And I said, if this man is hitting the heartstrings harder than anyone I've ever seen, if he doesn't come through on that change message, I will never forgive him. And you know, in my mind now, I, I realize, see, I voted for him. He wasn't doing so bad. I know a lot of people who didn't vote for him would think he was doing horribly. That's the way it goes. But once we hit BP, that man is a backer of plutocracy. That's all I have to say. I was proud for us to have our first black president. That's not why I voted for him, though, because once you're in that office, I don't care who you are. You better do your job. What is the job of the president of the United States? You don't hear that very often. He has several titles, but his main job was to be a representative of the people, not a king. That's right. He's not supposed to be the corporation's representative. So why is BP getting a lot more support from Mr. Obama than the people struggling in the Gulf? Why did our president say to eat the seafood down there? Oh, wait, wait until Lauren Goldfinch gets up here. Yeah. Wait until Kimberly Wolf gets up here. They've got some hard data. That's the stuff that I'm held accountable to. As an academician, I can't just make statements. I need hard facts and data. We can't even say we prove anything. If I can understand this stuff and that man went to Harvard Law School, I know he's playing games. He has to be playing games because I know he's smart. And I know that these people who gather on Capitol Hill right behind us, they're not stupid either. So I know it's got to be arrogance. What else could it be? They are not our representatives. I want my representatives back. I want my voice back. I want you to have your voices back. Hold them accountable. Get out of your parties. They don't care about what you need. I was on the central committee of the Democratic Party in Douglas County. They're going to run me out of there when I get home now. I can tell you that. I asked one day when they said they wanted to win elections. Okay, I, I get that. But, but don't we want to find candidates who are worthy of our votes, who are going to go to Washington and do what we need to do? You know what they said to me? Right to me. We want people to win elections. Really? This is a chess match? You aren't looking at the people? The party? I call the fourth branch of the government. You would not believe how much power they have. Some people call the media that. But political parties are too tied in to the candidates that come here and sit in your state legislatures. They are the fourth branch of the government. The planks that they put on their platforms impact you as much as the people that they prop up and decide who get to run. Take your country back, men and women. Teach your children. Teach your children well. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm going to stop.
monopolizing this microphone. Just because I started this thing doesn't mean someone can't cut me off. Okay? All right.